Okay, thank you for the long introduction, but thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, so I wrote out a long title, uh, Tessellation of Block Groups and Homology Groups, so I should maybe say that this is a work in uh, sort of very slow progress. Uh, in some sense, it was conceived, I think, as I did 20 years ago, and then, so uh, by Herbert, Philippe, Alphonse, Vincent, and by me, I think we were pretty much the project and sort of got stuck in it. So the idea was really to use some kind of uh, say, uh, GL2 of the ring of integers in the metric quadratic field, uh, acting on hyperbolic free space, and then sort of uh, tying this, of providing a tessellation, and using this to get some relative homology groups, uh, where you can sort of kill the relativity by going to the field as opposed to the ring of integers, and then you get something that should relate to a block group. And therefore you get now within K3 of the symmetric quadratic field in the end. Um, so this took uh, some effort and it was stuck for a long time and then uh, well, it got going more or less when Alexander Brown did certain things that could be used, it was not available 20 years ago. And then it sort of merchant out of control in some sense, uh, we got a shortcut to get a block group directly and forget about the homology group and uh, in the meantime to actually do some number crunching, have a gun thing and Saki were brought in and then we also turned out we needed the least amount conjecture for this thing. And, so as it wasn't really written down, we needed a intent factor two to get a grunt of growth in as well. So it's sort of going off in all directions. So my plan was to uh, sort of take easy in the sense that I want to just give a lengthy introduction, introduction sort of ignoring the experts. Uh, so let's uh, take the number field. Uh, all will be doing the images. And we need a pair of two. <coughs> and then, <coughs> so the whole starting point of all those special values was probably that, uh, well, normally you say the residue with s equals 1 of the zeta function, but in this case I look at 0. So this is going to be up to the sine equal to uh, the class number times the regulator divided by the number of rules of unity. So h <coughs> is the class number of O. And just to go to the K theory quickly, that would be the same as K to O and then the torsion part. Um, <coughs> the uh, W, that would be then, say, the uh, size of the torsion in the units, which is the same as the torsion in K1. And <coughs> the uh, last one is the R is the regulator, I think it'll be fine, it's not regulator. Of a uh, star, and of course, the star is the same as K1 and O. Okay, so this is a very classical formula from, I don't even know, 1880 or thereabout, maybe. And of course, once K theory had been defined, <coughs> and they realized there was an awful lot of K theory in this very classical formula, and then those I forgot to define here that the zeta K star at any integer n is always going to be the first non Vesson coefficient. Taylor expansion and then. Okay, so uh, because I already said we want to get to K3 uh, of the dimension of the field, and in that case we were looking at uh, minus one, but let me first uh, review some, some facts. Okay, so uh, <coughs> if you look at the localization sequence for the K theory here, then most of the time it splits into three sort of exact sequences. Uh, so the same group of uh, the integers will inject into the K theory of the ring, and this will uh, subject on the K theory of the finite residue fields. So this should be, this is exact the point. And just for comparison, <coughs> what happens if you take the lower groups, well then you get uh, sort of classical uh, number theory in the class group.
So this is also exact. And in this case, well, we said this is isomorphic to uh, O star, and this has moved to K star. Each of those is isomorphic to Z. Um, <coughs> so this is isomorphic to Z. And therefore, by splitting this, this is uh, isomorphic monocanonically to Z plus the class group of all the class group being the copy of the map here. Uh, <coughs> then, if you want to jump back and forth between the K group of the ring of integers and the K group of the number field, uh, you need to know something about the K groups of the uh, finite fields. So, take a finite field, and this is torsion. Except for n for k0, n is equal to z, like for any field, there's 0 for m, that is equal to an even. And if I take uh, m <coughs> equal to uh, 2n minus 1, so odd at least equal to 1, then it will be cyclic as more to z to the power of q uh, to the power n minus 1. Uh, <coughs> so that means in particular <coughs> that uh, Km of O is the same under this localization of Km of K for M is equal to 3 and O. That is going to distinguish between the K <coughs> using O and using K. Uh, <coughs> so thirdly, um, you need to know that all those K groups uh, so always trying to be generated. And then maybe as a separate thing for, which is not for long, I can write it here, <coughs> is that uh, the rank, so this is the result of Cullen, and Borel then computed the rank. So if you take an even one, well, again, k0 is going to be the intersection, so this will be 1 if n equals 0, and there will be uh, finite groups, even groups, k2, k4, etc. And the main interest in some sense is in the uh, odd ones. Uh, so here we have, uh, well, k1 must be the exception, so there will be r1 plus r2 minus 1 if n equals 1. <coughs> then will be R1 plus R2 for n equals uh, 3, 5, 7, etc. And will be R2 for n equals 2, 4, 6, etc. Okay, <coughs> so Borel also defined a uh, regulator map. So let me take the following shape. Uh, so you take an odd one, and I'm going to avoid K1 because it's more exceptional and uh, well known. So Borel defined a regulator map, and I'll be slightly vague what I mean by this in Borel at the moment, as this is only different by factor 2, so it doesn't matter at the moment yet. And you take this to the direct sum of all embeddings of k into the complex numbers of, uh, as you formulate nowadays, the correct list of real numbers. I think n equals n here. And then it lands in uh, <coughs> some eigenspace, some invariance, so for plus, that indicates the invariance. 
or the action of complex conjugation uh, on well, both uh, the embeddings and the coefficients are uh, 2 by 9. And if you then sit down, what comes out? Uh, so there's going to be R vector space, and it'll be either R to the power R1 plus R2 for N alt, and it'll be R to the power R2 for N E. And I haven't used it yet, but I'm going to assume that N is the to be 2. Uh, which is in that case, we get the dimension of the target. Vector space that's the same as the range of the cable. And <clears throat> so we're all showed that the image of this regulator is a lattice, so it's, uh, it spans the, uh, the thing as an R vector space. And uh, if you let uh, Rn be the uh, co volume. to uh, change the measure a little bit. So I'm going to say that uh, the following thing, so if I replace R by Z, I get a Z lattice and uh, I'm going to, this one is going to have volume one, so you normalize it according to this one. And then the statement was that uh, <coughs> Zeta k star with a 1 minus n. Uh, so this would be the functional equation corresponds to zeta k of n, where I think Borel probably stated this result, but for us it will be more convenient to use the functional equation. So this is going to be the form qn times this rn for some uh, qn in q star, right? So one zero is one. And um, <coughs> so let me just say as a separate remark that uh, Bob Cato, in their paper, uh, they interpret basically the uh, PQN or maybe positive time factors. So they interpret, say, evaluation with respect to a prime field, QN, in terms of periodic regulator maps. Prime, you have some mechanism that will tell you exactly how many prime factors P there should be in there. Um, but then, see, Wiefenbaum had a uh, different thought, apparently. Uh, <coughs> so he said that Qn <coughs> should be, well, 2 to some power, unknown times the size of k to n minus 2 of O. Uh, divided by the size of k to n minus 1 O. So in the first remark you mean the Tomagawa number conjecture? Sorry? So uh, that one. Yeah. So you mean they relate to the order of seven from P7? Yeah, but I don't want to get into this at all. But I want to say they basically have a mechanism of interpreting the factors P sort of uh, in a, using a periodic regulator. I mean, roughly speaking, you take some periodic regulator, you compare it to some fixed lattice. Okay. And then the sort of the index or generalized index, that is sort of the power of P that you should see here. That's a very short summary of, uh, of the road long pay. Yeah, but I basically want to say I don't want to go there because he look at uh, the well, in a completely different way. But see, he can now accept. Okay, let's look at the uh, this uh, thing here. This is the analogous of what I probably erased by now of the uh, well, the residue at as you go on the zeta function or the zeta k zero star. And it will be in that case k zero uh, 
torsion, the business of the torsion in this case. And uh, I should be saying whether I'm should be writing it didn't write it. Uh, so this will be K0 torsion in that case, but now in this case it's already torsion, and this will have probably some positive range, so here you have to take the torsion. And he did this, I think, you know, based on some sort of calculations by hand on some work by uh, Spencer Block and uh, Susan in terms of how you could when you get your hands on well, it could be different. Long, long before. Huh? It was long before that. Long before. Oh, but I think afterwards you have to explain to me how you computed regulators. If I do, we had to do with the burst state conjecture. Ah. For, zeta, for, my, for any for zeta minus one was this burst state conjecture. It basically said that. For K2, what didn't they know about K3? But they said for K2 divided by W2. Okay. Let's see. And then, uh, well, I was, it's a whole long story. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you okay. Later. okay. And um, so, well, I'll explain more in a way. Having the, uh, so basically up to the power of 2, this was uh, then known, and so the people knew they knew the power of 2 without making it explicit. So at some stage in this project, uh, not so long ago, we decided we probably really want to have this power of two, at least for our case, on that case, n equals two. And k was imaginary quadratic, and even then it uh, caused some trouble. So let me sort of give you a little bit of a summary of what Henry uh, Burns then proved. That's the rational number. <laughs> QM. So Matthias Flach also had this uh, kind of formula on the, <coughs> on the blackboard in his home for on his slides. Uh, but he didn't use the K group, he used the motif of homology, and there are all kinds of factors to be different. So his result looks very clean because he had a regulator and he had uh, well the upper thing there he called I think H and the lower thing he called W and then he just said this was H times uh, regulated divided by W. Um, <coughs> unfortunately with the K theory this is not so uh, nice so let me just sort of formulate as a well, proposition maybe. Uh, so the non power of the apart from the prime two this is already done before and the issue was to actually get the prime two fixed and it doesn't quite work so uh, so let's say that Boccato uh, holds for uh, a A0 of A1 minus N. I should say that N will be at least equal to here all the time. <coughs> Even only if the zeta k star 1 minus N is up to sign. So I can work now with this question mark there. Friedlander, and then you show that if you look at this thing, it's going to be subjective. 
but then uh, <coughs> you have to actually, in other parts of the theory, use a regulation method defined by Soleil, and it is not known they're the same for peoples too. So for all peers, it's actually known they're the same for peoples too. I think Chabot will tell me they're not the same. So that means you still don't have an explicit formula here, even if you know it is blocked out of the entry also. And, um, <coughs> okay, but what you do get is you get at least bounds on the correction term. You may go on the right down, but uh, there are some degrees, etc., and there's also the size of some case of n minus 2 with n of a degree 2, the most extension of the field result. Um, okay, so what we uh, <coughs> have more, so we also have the following. Uh, we know that this holds, so Bokkato holds, if uh, k over q is a medium. Um, <coughs> which still doesn't solve the problem entirely, but also Levine has actually computed that uh, this regulator of Soule for two is subjective if n equals two. Okay, so that means that in that case, at least for n equals two, you get a precise statement. Um, so if k over q is a medium, then the zeta a star s minus 1 is going to be 2 to the power of 1 plus r2. Um, times, well, times the k2 o size. <coughs> divided by k 3 all uh, tor size as a regulator for 2. Okay, so this seems to be the only case where you really know this conjecture now completely uh, into the model by super without any sort of strange correction terms. So let me just note that uh, <coughs> we want to do this later on for k measure quadratic, so that means I have one factor 2 here. And uh, we should make it explicit here. So if uh, k is imaginary quadratic, then you can actually compute <coughs> the size of distortion group because it's, uh, well, the thing itself is, as I already mentioned, the same as if the case of the field. And then, in this case, uh, so you go to the incomposable part by looking at the stuff module of the image of the non k 3 but in that case it's trivial, so you compute this and this turns about to be 24. Okay, so exactly <coughs> the same, uh, at least for this part, as uh, for Q. Okay, so the things that are unknown are the regulator and the size of K2. And uh, one of the starting points <coughs> was that uh, Herbert Gummel and Kevin Bailabai have been computing for a fairly large number of imagined perpetuals the exact size structure of Tatum. Okay, so <coughs> that means that uh, so we hear what this is known. So how do you get a regulator? So you uh, <coughs> want to know what uh, the K groups look like, of course, in that case. So let me again provide you back here. Is there any geometric interpretation of this number 24? Sorry? 
In your remark, is there any geometric interpretation of this number 24 uh, in terms of the geometry of the Bianchi threefold associated with the? No, I think that uh, so the way you compute this, you have that uh, K3 uh, indecomposable K uh, torsion. So this is again the V. Uh, so the size of that. No, it's Susan. What? It's Susan. What? K, K, K3 is Alpha Gawa at this end. And you know K3 at the algebraic closure by Susan saying. So okay, so then I should not be saying this. Okay, thank you. Uh, I mean, why I know this was not mean, but he probably recruits it in this paper. So this is <coughs> the case zero of uh, gal of uh, k bar of a k acting on q when it goes at this q. And I wonder why you can get this into the younger loops. Anyway, you can easily calculate <coughs> this because the, uh, so first of all, <coughs> uh, if you, in this case, uh, let this guy act on here, you can also throw in the gal group of uh, well, k bar of q for the commutator. <coughs> right, because this obedience will also act. So that means that in general you can reuse this calculation by taking the maximal obedience subfield of your k and you have the same k3 decomposable torsion. But then also because uh, this is even, every complex conjugation is act perfectly, so you can also act by the complex conjugations. And that means that in this case you can replace any k by the maximal total immunity in subfield. So you use the q right away without doing any, any work. Now, no, but I don't know any invitation because of young key. Uh, would be nice. Uh, in fact, in the calculation, I think we somehow see the k2 of O, that size show up, uh, and maybe that has something to do with young key, but uh, yeah, <coughs> to uh, understand that. Okay, so uh, <coughs> say if I want to go to the regulator. And I have to say something about uh, what to the cable loop line. And I'll take on the K3 of, uh, of K for simplicity. Okay, so one thing you could do is you could take uh, the moon of K3, so this would be K star <coughs> tensor with itself three times. Modulus stuff generated by the standard relations. Now you could map this <coughs> to K3 of K, and by definition, the token will be K3 of K in the composite. And I was actually surprised to find a few years ago that uh, apparently it is known, at least uh, it was known to Bruno Kahn. <coughs> This is an injection if at least you have a field of characteristic zero. So he uh, <coughs> has a, well, he ends up with extractor sequence for the prime two, and it was known by Susslin that going from here to K3, and then there's some term class map back to the normal K3, that was multiplication by, in this case, two factorial. So the kernel was two torsion, but he actually shows apparently that if the characteristic is, characteristic is zero, it's always an injection. And you moreover know that for a number field, so this is actually to z modulo to z to the power r1 if k is a number field. Okay, so for my measured quadratic field, that means that the number k3 is trivial and those are simply the same thing. And then, uh, well, based on the what Spencer Block had been doing, uh, Susan did calculations uh, for this K3 and the composable. So let me summarize this a little bit. Uh, <coughs> so we have a short exact sequence. Uh, also, zero goes to, let me say, T tilde, or maybe T at the moment, goes to K3, K in composable, uh, goes to one of the things that I call the block group. And uh, <coughs> so this T so is going to be the non trivial extension of uh, Tor, uh, or Tor 1. 
of the torsion in the field. Why is it modulo 2z? And then the uh, <coughs> characteristic of k is not the root. So I'll assume it's a number two, in this case, actually, uh, the field would uh, suffice to be infinite. And if the character is two, we just leave this out. You just get this one. And um, <coughs> so what is this bk? Well, that's the company internal of set on that. So I'm going to mark three this with and then we drop it from p. So this will map to um, <coughs> k star, 10 to z k star. And then symmetrize. So sorry, I'll, I'll get to that. It's okay. simple. So this is uh, k star <coughs> times k star. And then you make it uh, alternating, but it's probably it's a notion of what will be alternating. So in this case, you won't have this one. And this one <coughs> is going to be a free looping group on k except for 0 and 1. Modulo 5 to relation, but again, there are probably 5 to relations, so let me be specific in this case. So we want to have a little quotient. And that is going to be the one that you have up there. And then you quotient out as a torsion. <coughs> and it's just to normally show that uh, this guy will be 2 torsion, this will be 6 torsion. And <clears throat> then you get a following uh, well, little proposition which is really useful, that uh, uh, so the kernel, okay, so that should be, you have to modify the target also, so I don't pull this wedge so the two of k star, and it will be k star times um, k star, modulo x times <coughs> minus x, everything of that shape. And it will include the relation again. It's also a quotient for the thing of steps. And the map is still the same. x maps to, um, in this case, x sort of like still the one minus x. Okay, and uh, <coughs> so the kernel of this uh, delta 2, the partial 2. Uh, so this is a little bit simpler than what happens in Susan's case. <coughs> this will be uh, 0 
the theory it was key. As well to zero. And um, it will be as well to z if k is measured for that. <coughs> so if you go back to what happened here, so here was my kernel. I told you that the torsion in here has cyclic order 34, and then it depends a little bit on which number field you have. So for example, in the general case, your uh, t of this torsion will be of size 2, and then you extend it to something of size 4. So that means in general, the quotient of this guy, the torsion part in here, would be cyclic order 6. And very interestingly, Susan proves that this element is independent of the y that you choose. And if you don't have more than plus or minus 1 in terms of unity, it actually has order 6. So that one is thrown away in that case. And well, there's some other cases like you could have QI, and in that case, uh, well, you can do it. In that case, here I get four elements times two is eight, and then the quotient of this thing, 24 million, it is three. And it's actually the order of super use in that case. So somehow this solves it very nicely to give this result. And very pleasantly for calculations, that means that the kernel does two is torsion three. So if you do calculations, you can just multiply and don't use any information. Okay, and just for, well, you can analyze those things as we say a few things. Uh, so the uh, p bar of k, uh, if you look at the torsion, so that should be q, because as well to z model to z, and generated by the class of 2. Okay, so by what I just said before, in both cases uh, the torsion will be mapping injectively and the delta 2 in here, of course, you can analyze the torsion very well. The problem is that the class group is non trivial, it becomes a little bit harder. But for a trivial class group, it's simple, and you know the torsion in K2, so for Q, this is really simple to do. And this is for anything emission quadratic, it will probably a tank. And then, secondly, <coughs> also the speed bar of Q, which will be will inject into p bar of k for the dimension of the unless uh, your k is uh, qi and in that case the kernel is exactly the torsion that I will be for so you can analyze this is a little bit better than the thing without the bar of right Okay, <coughs> that is uh, one thing. So this actually tells you something about this uh, kernel using Suslin. And then in my thesis, I wrote also working on Zagay's conjecture mapped the other around it, sort of in general for uh, for high K groups. And uh, <coughs> I think it's still not quite known how compatible <coughs> to maps are. So let me just write down the proposition here again. Uh, so that's K be a number field. And <coughs> it exists a map uh, from the kernel of this uh, partial 2, 2k3 of k modulo torsion. Okay, so that is effectively the same thing as all k3 in the proposal modulo torsion. Uh, but here you get a map from this k3 in the proposal to say this one. And here we go the other way around. Uh, that's natural in K, and such that if I compose it with uh, this regulator map, so we have K3 of K, uh, well, the torsion will die, so I can close it out, and I map to uh, the regulator for embedding to R times 2 by R. Sorry, there is KT mod torsion or KT torsion? Yes. Well, actually, the paper we use sub and I'm sorry, I think we have TF torsion free. So I think this got uh, lost there. Okay, so this one uh, is induced so for an embedding of K into the complex numbers. So this is induced by uh, mapping a generator, uh, say X. Two, and I think now Herbert will start complaining. Uh, so I first embed x into the complex numbers, and then I need some version of the logarithm. And you may have noticed that it will kill me, kill me, imagine, 
So uh, <coughs> let me just stick to this convention. The dialogue in this case is going to be say integral from z from a half to z of log uh, epsilon value of w the argument of all minus w minus the log of epsilon value of minus w the argument of w. Okay, so this will kill the five formulation and the other relations and uh, Okay, so what we can do is to Spencer in my thesis at tensor of Q, and so in the meantime we did this thing. And for the lowest case, case we can actually keep track of the two quite nicely. And in the end, we want to try and find the generator of K3 of the dimension of the truth, which you cannot tensor with Q in this case. Okay, <coughs> so let me also point out, as I did before already, so there I go from the kernel of delta 2 to the K3 modular torsion, substitute based on this, and you result the other way around. I think we still do not know exactly what the composition is. And you will do this by comparing regulators, but I'm not entirely sure that, uh, I mean, here I actually claim, okay, the mention is this is the balance in the regulator by now. But then, uh, Guncho wrote down, I think, well, what he claims is the balance in the regulator on this level, but then I think he only claims it up to a non zero rational number. So we still need that to figure out what really is going on between the two. Okay, so how do we get uh, elements in this kernel uh, of this delta 2? So in the end, we'll use this tessellation, but we uh, need to do some preparation. So let the uh, K be any field here. And I, well, I may not need it today, but I would like to take, keep track of some degeneracy, so I'm actually going to take some subgroup inside K star. And then I'm going to uh, <coughs> take the two-dimensional vector space, except for the origin. And I want to take this modular multiplication by L. Okay, so think L as being, say, plus or minus 1, which is what we'll use in the end. If you take L equals K star, this will just be P1. But it will also mean that it will kill another group later on that's a little bit too large. Okay, so Cn of L, this will be some kind of configuration of points here. So this will be the free abelian group. On generators uh, L0 onto Lm, we of course have the Lm in this uh, thing L, uh, such that <coughs> if I go to P1, okay, so they scale on the K star, then they are the same in L, so they scale on the L. And 
what you are going to need is a map uh, 3 to uh, p bar of k, and you have 2 to this uh, wedge to tilde of k star. And then here we have this delta 2, but let me stick an L in because, I'm uh, sorry, I forgot to write this down. Uh, because uh, I don't really have points, I have to have a multi multiplication, so I have to close it out by a little bit, and then we k star. Wait, no. I think we all have a cousin mind all this tutorial. And this is simply uh, the previous um, <coughs> the previous uh, P bar K that they wrote down. But you could also write it more directly as taking the three being group on other things such as zero and one, and then you close it out by the image of okay, I didn't really write this here, but it's D4. And then the image of D4 followed by F3. Because the computer everything that comes out to get the exact old emulation figure. Uh, so what are the maps? Well, F3 will look extremely familiar. <coughs> so what do I do with a tuple of four points? Uh, I throw them away. If uh, sort of uh, you don't have four different points. Okay, and always take the cross ratio, which I will denote by C or 3. You don't like it, but that's sort of the index that sort of is. So L0 bar up to L3 bar. And oh, you say that L0 bar up to L3 bar in uh, P1, that up to the action of GL2 of K, you can move this uniquely to 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. That's what and it makes it a cross ratio. And <coughs> so the difference with what Gontrow did, etc., will be a bit more in the F2. Okay, um, so let's take uh, three lines of three, uh, of three elements. And um, <coughs> this to zero is uh, Li j bar, OJ bar. Uh, so this will be NP1 of k for some uh, <coughs> final b to j. Okay, but I impose the condition that if this is the same, so the scale of the k star, they scale on the L. So in some cases, this calculation is actually quite important. And apart from that, we're going to map this to well, what Gonjo defines explicitly by determinants, and I want to do it in an agrarian way. So just like in that case, if I take my points in F2 or in K2, <coughs> then what about the action of GL2 of K? I can make this uniquely to something of the following shape. Okay, and of course I have to allow the L because it's set up to scaling, and then the cross ratio sub 2 will be A wedge B. This is the optimal equation by this L. And then the diagram actually commutes, and really because I allow degenerate configurations in my C4, so I'm forced to do this essentially. Yeah. Yeah, because I could have a uh, degenerate configuration where so two points in C3 are the same, but the other two are distinct. If I take the boundary, I get two degenerate terms and two non-degenerate terms. I have to make sure the whole thing matches, which is a little bit tricky yeah, to, to get to work. Okay, so uh, F2 and F3 are alternating for respective groups. 
And OC, of course, uh, they don't see uh, the GM to pay in chain by construction. Because I define them using that. Okay, let me now uh, <coughs> start switching to the hyperbolic plane. So uh, let's take now uh, KE measurement for gravity. Okay, so I want to say that uh, using all this, I uh, would like to get the generator of K3 of K, which is the same as K3 in proposal in this case. And we actually view uh, the thing embedded in, the, in one of two possible ways. We take just a second. And then, uh, so if you take hyperbolic free space over, uh, well, I say over K, which means it's the usual uh, plus the cusps, or not plus, union, the cusps uh, pi 1 over K. Uh, <coughs> so they're connected on by, uh, well, of course, uh, it can work over K, but I prefer to work with gamma, which is P G L2 of O. And uh, well, Dan Yazaki and I think others before him uh, <coughs> so you can find the tessellation uh, so you chop your, uh, this thing into uh, keep the hip in a nice way sort of, uh, well, say, stable under, under this uh, gamma so it will act on it and out of that, <coughs> you get uh, the set sigma 3 of three cells. So the superhedra, uh, you get a, um, a bunch of two cells, and you get a bunch of vertices. Oh, sorry, vertices, you get a bunch of, uh, of edges. So all the cusps, all the, the cusps of those things, all the vertices will be uh, the cusps. And um, <coughs> so every element in the plane lies in exactly uh, either something in, in an order of three cell or two cell or one cell, uh, up to say stabilizers of uh, say a three cell. You have to really fold the thing into itself a little bit to get really a fundamental domain. And uh, so I set the limit, say that all vertices are cusps. And also all those uh, sigma j, which are finite. Okay, so then you can finally write down what uh, what will give you the ends and elements in the uh, in uh, K three. So I'll say that uh, the sigma three, well, there's a bunch of polytopes in there. Okay, I said T three here. This is not what I mean. It could be bigger, the uh, octahedra, etc. So some, some polytope. And um, <coughs> let's say that gamma i is then the stabilizer of this polytope pi in gamma. So are you descending to a subgroup that's already free or something or not? No, no. no. We don't need that. Um, Okay, what we had to do is actually analyze a little bit uh, how large those uh, gammas can be because the stabilizer is going to be uh, finite. Right. And uh, so we have to actually make a list and I think the order always divides 24. Oh, yeah. So that's something we need to do, that's what I'm about to write down. So what you will then get is a formal sum, the okay, alpha of uh, the sum over what index by the polytopes of 24 divided by the size of each gamma i and then times the, say the polytope. Okay, that's a form of some polytopes. And well you have to define of course a boundary map by simply looking at the faces on this and of course everything will glue uh, because of the well, the tessellation glues in a nice way. You have to be a little bit careful because uh, it could happen that sort of uh, you have an inner face between two cells and the cells are in the same orbit. So you and the face will sort of be identified with itself, and you have to be careful because it's going to show up here. It will be an extra factor two that you have to put in. Uh, but the point is that uh, the cross-sections here are integers, 
And uh, oh, uh, I think it was before, I might take the Hedra because then I have four cusps and infinity and I can apply my cost ratio, etc. So you go to chop your, uh, your point of the Hedra. Chop each uh, EI into, uh, or ideal tetrahedron, meaning they have uh, still with us vertices the, uh, the cusps, the only cusps. And we can get out of that, there'll be some alpha phi. And that's a formal sum of tetrahedron. may no longer match exactly uh, because for example before I could have a square as a face and I have sort of one point on that side and if I chop it into T3 I am actually triangulate with the side and would end up with this one and of course I have no control of something on the other side that may decide that it ends up like this so what you have to do is you have to uh, fix this with sort of flat T3 that's a uh, bunch of triangulations uh, match Okay, so uh, the faces may no, no, no longer match. Okay, so let's see okay, so an alpha t, an alpha f, which is a sum of flat tetrahedra, uh, such that the faces of uh, the sum alpha t of as they do match. So on the gamma. Okay, and then the uh, how do you now get back to the previous stuff? So now you uh, you take okay let me actually say that k is now equal to <coughs> qi of q of uh, square root of minus three to limit the size of the uh, roots of uh, unity in here. And then <coughs> you uh, take your L before you can take the plus or minus 1. So this will be the same as L star. And then you choose in every uh, cusp uh, a representative, say L uh, bar or L in each uh, <coughs> cusp. So the, up to uh, and you use gamma equivariant. Okay, so whenever you cusp, you just choose one, and then you extend this by uh, the action of a gamma, but then of course you run into the stabilizer of your cusp, and that's where somehow we have to analyze it with the units come back in, so they come back to haunt you here. And then, uh, <coughs> well, what you will do in principle is then you sort of uh, map uh, this alpha f <coughs> plus alpha t, uh, t plus alpha f uh, to um, well, it actually turns out to be let me say to p by k by mapping the tetrahedron so it will be l zero, l one, l two, and l three to well, to f three of uh, this tuple. So this will be in, in this bottle. Okay, and then you have to check with some calculation that you did it correctly, because I always get this, but of course I have to be in this kernel of delta 2. 
and it was essentially guaranteed by the uh, by the the faces uh, mentioned to take the correct multiple. So let me then uh, make it slightly easier to state and to compute, um, because the uh, you see if you do this, well, you really have to compute your polytopes, and you really have to chop them into tetrahedra. But then you end up with this annoying sort of bunch of flat flat tetrahedra that you have to compute. So the computer people prefer not really to do that. Um, <clears throat> so instead, they use complex conjugation. And well, if you look at the cross ratios for those flat tetrahedra, they'll be in the rational numbers. So by using complex conjugation, they drop out. So then take the theorem. Um, I should say that out of this, you get an element beta in this uh, Q bar of K. Okay, and then theorem, if you take beta minus beta bar, so it's just not complex conjugation X, so this is in the kernel of uh, delta 2 for L equals 1. Okay, because I'm actually changing at this stage, I actually have uh, to. Uh, I uh, just put a minus one, but if I do it correctly, I could do it a bit before and then multiply by two and get rid of this problem. Uh, <coughs> so remember, this is an isomorph to K3, K indecomposable, and that was isomorph to uh, two when we were If you now compose, uh, well, if you, because you can compare the thing, the, there's a volume formula using the, the dialog, which is related classically to the uh, zeta at, uh, at 2 and therefore to zeta star at minus 1. And <coughs> what you then find is uh, that uh, under, uh, well, that if you go to z here, so beta minus beta gamma maps to. Uh, or plus or minus 2 times the size of k to the O and the generator. Okay, so uh, well, you can sometimes do a little bit better, you can sometimes divide this guy by 2, and if you use the other element, you might get a better element. Uh, so let me give you one example. <coughs> And then make some remarks about uh, trying to define by this uh, size of state two. So you can imagine if you do this, uh, then most examples are way too big to write down. So let me take so the only one that is maybe not completely obvious is still uh, something that won't write down in a few minutes. So in this case, for Q squared of minus 5, there are two speed cells. And let me also say, take omega to be the square root of 5 times i. And so the alpha <coughs> that you get is 3 times 1 polyhedron plus 2 times another one. This doesn't say much, but that means that you have stabilized of site 8 and 12, apparently. So if you now chop this into, uh, into tetrahedra, of course, there's some kind of randomness in there. And uh, <coughs> you compute, uh, say, the cross ratio, you compute F3. Uh, then you end up with an element 
uh, let's say, you create a tilde for notation, there's going to be 7 w plus 2 divided by 3, minus 3 is minus 2 w plus 5 divided by 3, plus 3 omega plus 5 divided by 6, minus 2 times minus w, minus omega plus 7 divided by 6 again. And I should realize I haven't maybe really used the factor 4 at that stage, so I have to multiply by a few things. So it turns out that then, uh, if you can sort of multiply this thing by 4, you can get a phase 2 match. <coughs> so you need 4 times the class of 3, plus 6 times the class of 5. So it's a little kind of flat degree you have to do in to make the phases match exactly. And this will be really in the kernel of delta 2. So this will be K3, and decompose a little modular torsion. And in this case, <coughs> the regulator, okay, so this will map to a gamma in K3K in decomposable modular torsion. And in this case, you check uh, from the volume that you have that the regulator of gamma divided by 2 by i is actually exactly minus 12 times say the case star minus 1, and that will be the same as a minus the size of K2 O times this regulator 2. Okay, so this actually turns out to be equal to 1, so that means that uh, you actually, in this case, the gamma is a generator. Okay, so that is uh, what comes out in this very simplistic case. Uh, but then, in general, of course, uh, if you go back to uh, what I wrote, you end up with two times the size of K2. So this K2 is a little bit bigger, then you're quite annoyed, or maybe at least there's some more work to be done. So let me say that K is Q squared of minus 303. And I'm not going to write this down because it will be enormous to do. So this is interesting in the sense that there's a big prime, relatively big prime number in the size of K2. Okay, so uh, <coughs> Dan and Sir Herbert, the computer people on the team, so they actually succeeded in dividing, in this case, the, uh, the gamma that you get here, which is enormous, minus gamma prime, and in this case, you can already avoid multiplying by 2 there, by, well, you still have to multiply by uh, 32. Okay, so <coughs> the calculations are quite big. Um, because uh, they have to really do this using five formulations, and they make some so life a little bit easy because the five formulations is sometimes not unique because you can place x by one over x and stuff. So there are some things they symmetrize that. And what they in the end get a generator of say the kernel of delta 2 uh, with uh, 106 terms and all coefficients. Generators to the minus 2. Okay, in the end, actually, dividing by 22, we use all kinds of symmetries that simplifies this because the way it comes out of tessellation is much more complicated. And um, yeah, let me just sort of finish a little bit because I'm not going to do the homology as I'm already over time. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the original idea was that uh, you can simply take this. This kernel delta 2 in the compute. You take, some, you take enough elements, you compute uh, the image, and you look for the relation. So, computing the kernel there is completely algebraic. But then you compute the regulator, and you compute this as a real number. So, <coughs> what you then do is you compute essentially the quotient of your regulator in the z at k star minus 1. So, this should be the size of k2 divided by size of k3, essentially, times at that stage an unknown power of 2, which could be anything. But it means there is no way of actually knowing that if you believe that this quotient looks like 4, it could be actually some, say, 2 to the power of 100 plus 1 divided by 2 to the power of 98 or something like this, right? It could be something that looks like an integer, but it's not. Uh, <coughs> so at that stage, it was very useful to have this approach because uh, this thing here is completely algebraic because you know exactly what the volume is going to be in relation to, to the zeta value. Okay, and if you then divide algebraically, you really know that you have found the correct element. There's no rounding. But then, because we really got uh, surprised that, you know, do we really know if we have a generator? For that, you need the least amount of conjecture. 
And so we ask David Burns, and then you get this maybe this, this formula, but it also means that it sort of kills, in some sense, the necessity for this approach. Because once you have that theta um, star minus one is uh, plus or minus what's minus two times the size of K2 divided by 24 times this regulator two. So if you now have a multiple, well, if you have a bound for this one, then you just solve what your regulator is going to be something like 12 times this divided by a certain bound. So if you have a, an element in the k-loop, you always get this out of block loop, then the quotient that you compute is not just some, uh, some rational number, it's actually going to be a rational number of some bound in the denominator. So if your precision is high enough, then you just round and then you have a proof. So in some sense, by spotting in the leaf amount from the paper, uh, well, the paper is now a little bit uh, two approaches that say some things are overlapping in the wrong way. Anyway, as I say, I have no time for homology, I would like to be good at this, so thank you. Questions? <laughs> So the original idea was, uh, or modified uh, to what one can do nowadays, is you look at this tessellation and say that you have a cusp here and I have something that uh, sort of comes in as like a t And the problem is if you sort of tessellate <coughs> like this and you have points, what I would like to go for the homology is I want to live to a matrix. And of course the stabilizer of such a cusp is infinite. Mm -hmm. So what you use instead is you use the modification of uh, Moreau and Serre. And uh, <coughs> well, in this case, every cusp is now replaced by a copy of C. And <coughs> that means if you look at this, uh, well, this would be part of the tessellation of the plane, then you sort of get, in this case, sort of basically a square here. And then you get four things coming out. Okay, so what is here a nice tessellation of your hyperbolic plane? In this case, gives you under a quotient that you have to make take a certain multiple. Uh, well, in that case, it blues. The phase that you have already will still blue, and this thing will not blue, but the sides of this one will end up blueing if you do it correctly. Okay, so out of this, you basically get uh, some kind of uh, manifold of boundary. And you get, uh, well, not quite one-to-one uh, -one correspondence, but the stabilizer here will now act on this copy of C, which will basically act by a translation of some fractional value. Right, so that means that the stabilizer of the points that I see here are now going to be finite. Okay, so you basically get all the, uh, sort of the new vertices that correspond to uh, elements of, uh, of gamma, say, up to small torsion. And then what you do is you uh, triangulate, or you, uh, or you chop your <coughs> new, uh, manifold into tetrahedron. Okay, but you get many more, because here this looks like it could be, well, you get only one cusp, but of course here I have to make it more complicated. A lot of those would be having zero volume if I collapse them back to where they come from. You got it having zero volume, but then it would be important to get the homology right. And then uh, you will lift the vertices to our well, section matrices. 
And it's a little bit of a lie because uh, you have to work with some other matrices because not all the customers are in the same orbit for gamma, so you have to use some other matrices. Uh, but what you get out of this is basically something like uh, an element in, uh, in H3 of uh, gamma and then relative to the, uh, to the stabilizers. Okay, so to stabilize the original cusps. Uh, because that, so the boundary map in the relativity to the H2 would give you the exact same kind of colors you have in there. Now, the, the rest of the idea, that was the original Benf project, is that if you, so this gamma i, it sort of looks like, uh, say, one star, maybe some fractional angle i i, zero. And then uh, the idea was that you now extend to, say, the field k from O, but then if you map this into, say, star, star, <coughs> zero, one, in GL2 of k, so Susan will tell you that if I leave out this time in place of a zero, then I get exactly the same homology. So that means that anything that looks like this at homology level in here is just dying. Okay, so that means that there's a boundary map that I've written right down to the uh, H2 of the gamma i, but if I then go from O to K, and you can do a little bit better, you don't have to go all the way, then I really get something in H3 of GL2 of K. With modulo something coming in, but that would be of this shape, and that would be just the H3 of GL1. And this, if you if you have tens of this kind with Q, so if I have tens of this kind with Q, this will be going to be A3 of A. Okay, so that was actually the original approach to the bench approach to go through this entire thing, but it's something we found a shortcut. But then it's still interesting, you actually can explicitly compute, if you like, some elements in the homology, which will be, you know, I said those elements in the K group would be complicated, and then the homology would be far worse, because you have to have all those sort of uh, well, very flat T per it will just be there, plus the fact that you would have to explicitly do this killing of the homology. So you get an enormous thing, and that's why I haven't written it out yet, but uh, if you do this correctly, I think you can actually sort of bound how much you have to localize to make this work. You certainly don't have to go to the uh, to K. And it's obvious because everything is finite, so whatever you do, it will involve on finding many denominators. And I think you can have some more control than that. Okay. More questions? Do you share?